that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. come and meet me out here in Washington, D.C. I've found something incredible. It's really going to blow your mind. As you know, I've been studying the place for a while, but now I've found symbolism associated with the people who built this place that is just incredible. This is evidence of something really huge, Scott. Get here as quick as you can. I'm in Washington, D.C., following up on a cryptic call from my old buddy, Alan Butler. He says there are secret symbols hidden in the design of D.C. And if there are, I want to see them for myself. D.C., or the District of Columbia, has been the seat of power for the president since 1790. The National Mall runs through the center of the city and includes the U.S. Capitol, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, and the White House. I'm meeting Alan on the steps of the Capitol building to learn more about the architects who designed this city and about their allegedly mysterious motives. Alan, how you doing? I'm fine, man. Are you? I'm doing fine. Ah, oh, boy, have I got something to show you. You do? I tell you what, that phone call was very cryptic, and you definitely got my attention, so do tell. Well, I've discovered that this whole city of Washington is filled with symbols left here by a secret society. Do you happen to have a map of Washington with you? I brought one with me. Let's go over here. All right. Well, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to put some dots on here on some of the major intersections in Washington, DC. There's four there. And the most important one goes right in the center of the ellipse. We're going to join those two lines together. We're going to put another line down there to the ellipse. We're going to have a third one there to the ellipse. And then we're going to have another one there. Now, what do you see, Scott? Well, I'll tell you what I see is I see two Vs. It's an ancient symbol of the sacred feminine or the goddess. Many have speculated about the significance of the shapes that can be created when connecting important landmarks throughout the city. For example, a five-pointed star, symbolic of both Venus's orbit in the sky and of the goddess Venus herself, connects the White House, DuPont Circle, Mount Vernon Square, Washington Circle, and Logan Circle. Connected another way, they form two Vs, which is also a goddess symbol known as a chevron. Goddess worship, or worship of female deities, was practiced by many ancient cultures, including the Romans, Greeks, and Egyptians. Alan thinks it's no coincidence stars and Vs are found here. 
though I need a little more evidence to convince me. What really interested me when this cropped up was not just that the chevrons were there, but the actual length of them. Each of them measures 366 megalithic yards. Megalithic yards? Yeah. I've yeah. never heard of that before. What's a megalithic yard? The megalithic yard is an ancient unit of linear measurement. It was rediscovered by a Scottish engineer called Alexander Tom. He measured over 600 of the most famous monuments in Britain and France, like, you know, places like Stonehenge. Understanding the megalithic yard is critical to Allen's theory. Allen believes that the megalithic yard, which is equivalent to 2.72 feet and is often used in units of 366, was used to design structures like Stonehenge over 3,000 years ago. This was the same time ancient cultures were practicing goddess worship. If we can prove that the megalithic yard was also used in DC, it could mean that the architects of our nation's capital were also familiar with goddess worship. Like we might use the foot or the meter, they were using a unit which was 2.7 feet in length, and he christened it the megalithic yard. We have it here in Washington, D.C.? I know, it's incredible. These units of 366 megalithic yards are all over the city. There are dozens of examples. And although it's incredible, it's true. Okay, I have another question for you. 366, does this have anything to do with the number of days of the year? Is it connected that way somehow? Yes, it is. The year that was used by the people who built Stonehenge and the other monuments was 366 days in length. So these units of measurement also related to a measurement of time. But I can show you something else which is really going to blow your mind. Hmm. Do you fancy a pint? Now you're talking my language. Let's go. Alan believes the discovery of the megalithic yard in Washington, D.C. is a big deal. This is because the use of the megalithic yard here would suggest the designers of D.C. were influenced by the same ancient beliefs as the builders of prehistoric monuments like Stonehenge. I think it's possible the designers of D.C. were hiding clues to their own beliefs. Well, Alan, I like this experiment already. Well, I can't think of a better place to carry out an experiment, can you? <laughs> All right, so what's the plan here? OK, what I'm going to do with this beer is prove to you that the megalithic yard and its components is still alive and well right here in the United States. This cube has sides which measure exactly one-tenth of a megalithic yard. What I want you to do is to pour that pint into that cube. And if oh. I'm correct, it will fill that cube absolutely to the top, proving that the pint is a megalithic unit. Alan's experiment has proven to me that the megalithic yard is not only a real measurement, but also that this 3,000-year-old unit still has relevance and is with us today. Well, I tell you what, Alan, that was pretty impressive. And as far as the megalithic yard existing in ancient times, I'll buy it, OK? But what does that got to do with Washington, D.C.? And what does it have to do with goddess worship? We all know that the megalithic yard is an extremely ancient unit. It goes back in Britain to at least 3,500 B.C. The woman within society at that time was seen as being something very special because she had the power to create life just the same as nature has the power to produce crops and fruits and animals and all the rest of the things that human beings need. I can appreciate that. I mean, if we go back far enough, they didn't understand procreation, so all of a sudden this female is, is giving life. That would have been mysterious, and I can see why they would look upon women with reverence. So, hence goddess worship, right? Absolutely. Many ancient cultures and some secret societies may have practiced goddess worship and represented it through the use of symbols, like the V's I saw earlier on the map. Allen believes that the same people who revered the goddesses used an ancient unit of measure called the megalithic yard. The discovery of both in DC suggests to me that goddess worship could have been going on here as well.
Why is it that it has to be veiled? Why all the secrecy? Why embedding it within Washington, D.C.? The goddess-worshipping people were very much marginalized. We tended to end up with a much more patriarchal sort of religion. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, the people who were the most devout of the goddess worshippers, they had to find somewhere to go so that they could maintain their beliefs without being persecuted. So I think to a great extent it was driven underground. And so you're saying it survived in part due to the megalithic yard? Um, I think the two probably survived hand in hand. The people who used the megalithic yard, it was part of their pact, their mm -hmm. secret, mm -hmm. their pact with the goddess. And it became just as secret as the goddess herself was secret. So Alan, do you really think that there are symbols and signs of goddess worship embedded in Washington, D.C.? Oh, absolutely, Scott. Have you got the map that we were using earlier? Yep, right here. So look, Scott, Yeah. Um, the double chevron. The chevron has always been associated with female sexuality. That's right. It's the pubic triangle, the symbol where life comes from, a very ancient symbol that's been around probably forever. And it's not the only symbol we can associate with the goddess that we might find in and around Washington, D.C. There may be cases of other chevrons, and perhaps most significantly, we might find diamonds. Diamonds, okay, the diamond, that's very important. The diamond shape has represented many things throughout history, and it is still used today. In esoteric circles, it serves as a symbol of the birth canal. The diamond shape is also used to celebrate the female as the life giver, which is a basic principle of goddess worship. You know, the District of Columbia is in the shape of a diamond. It's 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles, 100 square miles that are marked by 40 boundary stones around that perimeter. There's your goddess symbol again. And I tell you what, I need to go take a look at one of these boundary stones. I think it will connect the Founding Fathers with goddess worship. Do you realize what you're suggesting? I mean, this is, this is pretty provocative. In fact, when people hear about this, they're gonna go, no way. But if you have measurements, the megalithic yard, and it exists here, and you can show and demonstrate it enough, you might be able to convince people, and that would be borderline explosive. I'm here in Washington, D.C., investigating whether the monuments and buildings lining the city streets are part of one big secret. My historian friend, Alan Butler, has a controversial but potentially groundbreaking theory. He says the architects of our nation's capital used a long-lost unit of measure called the megalithic yard to plan the city's design, a unit of measure he believes was used by ancient people who practice goddess worship. Alan and I believe there's a reason these goddess symbols are here in D.C. But first, I need to understand who helped establish the D.C. location as our capital and why. Fergus, I'm investigating a theory that involves the boundary stones that outline Washington, D.C. But the first thing I'd like to know from you is how did D.C. get to where it is geographically? Well, imagine we're back in 1789. The Constitution has just been signed. There's a consensus that the country needs a permanent capital. The capital's been wandering from town to town for 10 years. That permanent capital would be a physical symbol of unity for these 13 fractious states that comprise the United States. But when plans for our nation's capital started to take shape in 1790, many cities were fiercely vying to be chosen. There were more than 30 locations under consideration, including Newport, Rhode Island, Williamsburg, Virginia, and Annapolis, Maryland. Each city made their case, but a backroom deal led to Maryland and Virginia donating land for DC's construction as part of the Residence Act. So Fergus, why would they pick Washington DC? Wasn't it all swamp land back then? Well, actually it was pretty good land. It was pasture land. It was never really a swamp at all. Plenty of rolling hills here in the district. As a matter of fact, Capitol Hill, the Capitol is on a hill. 
the notion that it was a swamp was propaganda. It was propaganda launched by other parts of the country that wanted the capital for themselves by denigrating the Potomac. Another thing that strikes me as very curious is when you look at the shape, and, and I understand that we're talking about 100 square miles, the layout, 40 stones that make up this, what I see is a diamond shape. Congress mandated that the federal district, as it was called, would be a square. Why does it look like a diamond? Because George Washington stretched it so that the one corner of this square would incorporate the city of Alexandria, where he owned property. I see. This is one of the original boundary markers. The first boundary stone was laid in April 1791. Over the next two years, 40 boundary stones were laid to mark the diamond-shaped 100 square mile area that President Washington had chosen for the city. 36 of these 200-year-old stones have survived to this day, making them the oldest federally placed monuments in the United States. Well, I tell you what, it's in pretty good shape. I mean, it suffered a little wear and tear, but uh, it does feel like sandstone. I think it's called the Aquia Sandstone. And my understanding is there's a number of buildings in the capital city that are made with this sandstone, including the White House. And the Capitol building itself. The Capitol itself, OK. Well, you can still see the inscription. And on the side there, I think it's uh, 1792. The first stone was placed at Jones Point on the Virginia side of the river in a Masonic ceremony. George Washington was present and quite a few other prominent members of the community. I know that George Washington, like many of our founding fathers, was a Freemason. Fergus said Washington was the one who altered the plan to include Alexandria and make the boundary stones into a diamond. Maybe he had a secret reason for that. Along with some of the greatest ancient civilizations, like the Romans and the Egyptians, the Freemasons may also have been secret practitioners of goddess worship. And if a mason created a diamond symbol with boundary stones like this one, other symbols might be hidden here too. So how about the street system now? That's a whole nother thing that many researchers have pondered over to this day. Well, for that, Washington picked uh, Pierre Charles L'Enfant, a remarkable Frenchman who had served uh, heroically with Washington in the Revolution. Pierre L'Enfant was a brilliant architect. He was trained as an engineer. He was a man with a mathematical head. He was admired deeply by Washington and other founders. On the other hand, he was a pain in the neck. <laughs> he couldn't get along with anybody. Even Washington, who adored him, was so irritated by the man, he fired him. Interesting. OK, so you've seen the layout of the city, obviously. And it is a series of angles and geometric shapes. Have you ever heard of the concept of sacred geometry? I've heard of the concept. OK. This is one of the main tenets of Freemasonry. And we know George Washington was a Freemason. Our understanding is L'Enfant was a Freemason. And I think there's pretty strong evidence to suggest that this whole concept of sacred geometry is part of what inspired L'Enfant in the layout of the city. What do you think about that? I don't agree with it at all. Okay. I don't think there's any major historians of the early federal period or of early Washington who would uh, agree with that. And as far as any Masonic connections or symbolism associated with masonry that was incorporated into the design of the city, your thoughts on that? I don't think it exists. You don't think so? No. OK. Well, I disagree. I respectfully disagree. In fact, I think it's obvious. And on one level, when you look at the geometry of the city, I believe the diamond its shape itself of the District of Columbia is where it all starts, and that's just the beginning. I think it is related directly to masonry. I think the founding fathers, George Washington, absolutely for sure was involved in laying down these secret symbols and signs within the city, and that's what I'm investigating. Part of what I'm looking into is something I believe the Founding Fathers embraced and that all Masons embraced. It's something called goddess worship. And I also believe that our Founding Fathers and people in Washington right up to this day had a secret agenda 
hiding something important, perhaps a religious ideology that we're not aware of that's embedded within Washington, D.C. There may be clues that Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, could in fact be a city dedicated to goddess worship. Female shapes and symbols suggesting it's the city of the goddess might have secretly been included in the city's design. Many of the designers of D.C. were Freemasons, a secret society that I believe may have revered women as goddesses. Their use of symbols here, together with their use of what may be an ancient unit of measure called the megalithic yard, could have been important. And I'm just starting to understand how important. While I checked out the diamond-shaped perimeter of the city, my friend Alan was working to find some more clues hidden in plain sight here at the Washington Monument. How's it going for you? Well, it's a little bit difficult, as you can see, because of all the work that's going on here at the monument. Yeah. Uh, but generally speaking, the measurements are holding up quite as I expected. Really? Yeah. But we haven't finished. Do you want to help me go on measuring? Absolutely, let's go. So what we need to do, Scott, is get to the very end of this ellipse. OK. And then take a measurement to the base of the monument. I'm going to start by drawing an ellipse. Right. So then what we have is we have another ellipse. That's it. Right? And then we have a second ellipse. Yeah. And then we have the Washington Monument right here, That's correct? It. Yep. I need to take a measurement from so here to the edge of the monument. About 173 megalithic yards. So. And I can tell you that the monument has a base of 55.125 feet. And how many megalithic yards? 20.25. I also would like to use the measuring wheel and do the whole circumference of the circle just to make sure we've got it absolutely okay. right. Okay. Architect Pierre L'Enfant, the man behind DC's street layout, decided to put the Washington Monument on the mall. Construction didn't begin until 1848. That's when the cornerstone was laid in a Masonic dedication ceremony. Completed after the Civil War, it's the tallest stone obelisk in the world at 555 feet. There's one particular thing about this area that I've noticed, and I managed to get a picture which will illustrate it really well. So as you can see, this is the outer ellipse. Now the distance from that point of the ellipse, the widest part, to that point of the ellipse is exactly 366 megalithic yards. Exactly? Yeah. That's incredible. Absolutely. 366 is the number of megalithic yards found throughout the city. Like the Chevron Allen showed me, it could be a throwback to when ancient people used a 366-day calendar year. It has to be more evidence the people who designed this were using the measurement intentionally. How come nobody knows about this? I don't know. I guess, I guess it's because they don't know what they're looking for. I mean, would you look for a 5,000-year-old measurement in a 300-year-old city? And you, you wouldn't even know about it to look for it. But what I really want to ask you, Scott, is what do you see in the center of this picture? What we have here is two ellipses, but oftentimes you'll have two circles. Sometimes will be symbolic of male and female. And when you push those two circles together, you create a vertical almond shape. This is called sacred geometry in esoteric circles. But that vertical almond shape that you create is something called the vesica Pisces. Vesica Pisces is the name of the shape created when two circles intersect and overlap to form an oval. The term comes from the Latin phrase that means bladder of a fish. A similar shape is seen in religious symbols, such as the Christian fish symbol. Most importantly, Allen's research suggests the shape is sometimes used by Freemasons and can even be seen as symbolic of female genitalia. 
It's an ancient representation of the female vagina. And here again, this gets into this thesis you have of goddess ideology or goddess worship being embedded into the city of Washington, D.C. Absolutely. And, and look at the symbolism, Scott. We have a huge phallic representation mm -hmm. in the goddess representation of the vagina. That is the union of heaven and earth, as well as the union of the god and the goddess. And so what this represents is this concept we've talked about many times, symbols and signs hidden in plain sight. Absolutely. Well, you've demonstrated that the megalithic yard measurement is used here in Washington, D.C., and specifically at the Washington Monument. I was thinking about the whole layout of Washington, D.C. We're talking about this information of the megalithic yard and the goddess ideology being kept in secret. Well, take a look at this. I was looking at the boundary stones, the diamond with the 40 boundary stones of the District of Columbia. It just struck me that there's a symbol that appears to tie the Freemasons to everything that we're doing here in Washington, D.C. Take a look at that. What do you see there? The square and compass. The square and compass. You know what, Alan? This compass in the square in the shape of a diamond, I mean, it's fundamental, it's obvious. It's an exact replication of the diamond that encircles Washington, D.C. This is the connection, I think, that absolutely ties it to nobody else but the Freemasons. And don't forget, Scott, that that diamond going around Washington, D.C., is the District of Columbia. Who is Columbia? The goddess. The goddess. Most people think of the name District of Columbia as a reference to explorer Christopher Columbus. However, Columbia was also the name of a pagan goddess who was a symbol of liberty. Female personification of liberty can be seen all across America, from the Statue of Liberty in New York to the statue of the goddess atop the Capitol Dome and even in the logo of the Hollywood studio, Columbia Pictures. Alan, I don't think there's any question about it at this point that the only people who could be behind these secret symbols that lay out this goddess worship in Washington, D.C. has to be the Freemasons. I agree. So at this point, what I feel I need to do is I've got to talk to a Freemason that, that might know something about this. That's the only way to get to the bottom of it. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm at the Scottish Rite Masonic Temple. The Scottish Rite is a branch of Freemasons said to have special hidden knowledge. From the real assassins of Abraham Lincoln to the true meaning of the symbols in DC. I'm looking into the mysterious design of Washington, DC. There is no question that in the city of Washington, many symbols exist and have to do with Freemasonry. What I'd like to know is, did the Founding Fathers embed these symbols within the city that indicate goddess worship? In DC, everywhere you look, you find goddess statues and goddess symbols. The architects of our nation's capital might have been hiding a big secret amongst its streets and monuments. For those who had the eyes to see, there's one man who knows more than most about Freemasons and their motivation behind the use of symbols 
to represent their ideas and beliefs. If anyone knows whether Masons were hiding secret symbols of goddess worship in DC, it's Akram Elias. Akram, I recently talked to a historian of the city who absolutely denied a connection between Freemasonry and the symbols that I saw here that clearly indicate the handprint of Freemasons. Are these symbols the work of Freemasons or not in Washington, D.C.? There is no question that in the city of Washington, many symbols exist and have to do with Freemasonry. The language of symbolism was paramount, was essential to the enterprise from the beginning. Now, interestingly enough, every major architect who worked on the city's design and architecture, starting with Pierre L'Enfant, the architect who worked on, on the White House, the United States Capitol, happened to be Freemasons. It makes sense to see Masonic symbolism in almost every one of those symbols in the city. But that does not mean, however, that these architects came together as a group and conspired, as some of the conspiracy theorists talk about. So what you're saying is, is there's not necessarily a grand plan that they all got together and said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. However, because they had the same basic training in Freemasonry, a lot of these concepts and ideas are inherent, so they're naturally going to come out. Is that what you're saying? Correct. I want to tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've done with Alan Butler. He has documented, to my satisfaction, that the Founding Fathers incorporated a unit of measure, something called the megalithic yard, that he has documented pretty much all over the city, that he believes goes back thousands of years. So the question is, is there a secret system of measure that was incorporated into the design of the city by the Freemasons? Numbers are essential in the language of Freemasonry. Uh, in fact, they are essential to the natural order of this universe. It is no coincidence that even in the Bible, you have a book on numbers. And the most important thing in the city that I would say, geometry. At the heart of the design of Washington, D.C. is geometry. Now, interestingly enough, geometry is feminine. It is now, feminine. It is feminine. In Freemasonry, we speak of the deity, whatever that supreme intelligence is, as the grand architect or the grand geometrician. This is where the letter G is used in. Between the compass and the Between square. The compass and compass. So okay. it's geometry. The square and compass is both a measurement tool and one of the most recognizable symbols of the Freemasons. The square is said to symbolize integrity and maybe where we get the phrase fair and square. The compass represents an initiate's journey of understanding as he moves through the different levels of Freemasonry. The G at the center is connected to geometry, a female concept, and another possible link to the sacred feminine. Are Freemasons goddess worshipers? For Freemasonry to worship anything or to tell people to worship anything, that goes against the essence of Freemasonry. However, in the teachings of Freemasonry, the duality, the balance, the equilibrium between the feminine and the masculine are at the core. Some researchers suggest that the feminine seems to be emphasized through symbols and signs within Washington, D.C. Freedom is a feminine concept. This city is dedicated to the feminine, that is freedom. Freedom is represented by the feminine, not by coincidence. Having the feminine as well as the masculine represented through symbols in the city of Washington makes sense because Washington, D.C.'s hidden symbols and mysteries in its architecture and design reflect an idea, and that is that there is feminine and masculine. Okay, I think I get it now. And after everything that I've seen so far in this city, these Freemasons, by and large, they incorporated feminine symbols and that duality of male, female, heaven and earth, good, bad, light, dark, back into balance. America is much more than a land, much more than a country, much more than a people. It is an idea. And that idea is liberty, freedom. Hello? Scott, I've been taking these measurements, and what I've discovered will blow your mind. 
I found more evidence of the use of the megalithic measurement here in DC. But I've also found an amazing connection that links to an ancient site in England that was built over 3,000 years ago. Where? The Pentagon. What? Could the architects of Washington, D.C. have designed this city as a temple for goddess worship? A spiritual practice linking many of the world's most advanced ancient civilizations represented in secret symbols? That's what I'm trying to find out. Everything I've seen so far leads me to believe the symbols hidden in the city's layout are important in proving that theory. And there's one more place I need to check out, the Pentagon, a place that's significant to me. As a forensic geologist, I was part of the team that examined the fire-damaged concrete after the attack here on 9-11. All right, Alan, <laughs> you've piqued my interest more than a little bit. We're here at the Pentagon, a place where I spent time after 9-11 working on this building, so it's very meaningful to me. Hijacked American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. As a forensic geologist, I was called to examine structural damage after the terrorist attack. Later, I learned what a significant date 9-11 was for the Pentagon. The attack came exactly 60 years to the day after construction began on the new headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense. Several locations were considered, but President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself finally selected the site. And I wonder why he chose that location. The reason that I brought you here is because the Pentagon specifically associates with a place in my own homeland back in England. I'd like to show you a couple of photographs, if I may. This is a place where you've been, Scott. <laughs> Stonehenge. Exactly. This is at least 5,000 years old, has a circular henge, yep. and then a smaller circle of stones. Yep. And are you going to tell me there's a connection here with the Pentagon? There absolutely is. All pentagons have to be designed within a circle. And the circle around the Pentagon is exactly five times the size of the henge at Stonehenge. What Alan appears to have discovered could be earth-shattering. It could mean that the headquarters of our nation's military was designed with ancient principles of another goddess-worshipping group of people. Stonehenge is a place that may have been constructed using the megalithic yard. That's the same ancient measurement that Alan and I believe we found in DC and that may link to ancient goddess-worshipping cultures. Wasn't it President FDR who made the final decision of where the Pentagon was going to be located? It certainly was. And he also had something to say about its overall design. It was intended to be further over originally and right. nearer to the city. On the very last day before construction began, he pulled rank as Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces and said, no, I don't want it there. I want it on this site of the old Hoover Airport. And by the way, FDR was a Freemason, was he not? 33 degree. 33rd degree Freemason. OK, the question then becomes, why did he want to move it here? Why here? I think the reason that he wanted to do it was because it was sending a message to other Freemasons. In doing this, in putting the Pentagon here, he created a megalithic triangle, which led from the Capitol to the Pentagon from the Pentagon to the center of the ellipse, and from the ellipse back to the capital. And that triangle was 33 times 366 megalithic yards in length. And of course, he was a 33rd degree Freemason. The number 33 is significant to the Freemasons. The number 366 may have been significant to ancient people, like the ones who built Stonehenge. 
it used to be the length of the year. The triangle can be seen as yet another symbol of the female, the goddess. The fact that we have a megalithic triangle incorporating both of these numbers here in DC, linking America's most significant structures, in my view, is no coincidence. I think it could be further evidence that the Freemasons, who had a role in building our nation's capital, were replicating the architectural practices of ancient cultures, ancient cultures that were likely involved in goddess worship. Alan, this is incredible. This has to indicate that they had to have used the megalithic system, does it not? I think that's absolutely the case. And when we look back, we see with Stonehenge, 4,000 years ago, they're using the megalithic yard. The plan of Washington, D.C. is laid out, and the megalithic yard is already inherent in that plan. After that, we have the Pentagon, which again is using the megalithic yard. Alan, you continually amaze me. This discovery of the megalithic yard is incredible. Quite clearly, FDR knew that it was inevitable that the USA would be drawn into the Second World War. That's why the Pentagon was built. He must have looked out many times from up here and seen the statue on top of the Capitol, which after all is the goddess, but it's the goddess in the guise of armed freedom. We've seen goddess symbols all over the city. I think in part it was due to a veneration of the sacred feminine. The goddess is a symbol of freedom, which is one of the messages our founding fathers was trying to send. Everything I've seen suggests to me that Washington, D.C. could be the city of the goddess. I believe that there are indications that the megalithic yard could have been used to lay out America's capital and that it may have been used in the past by societies that revered a female goddess above or on par with a male god. I think the builders of D.C., many of whom were Freemasons, may have revered a goddess as well. This 5,000-year-old unit of measure may have been used hand-in-hand -hand with a reverence for the feminine that was a sacred part of the ancient world. And I think that both the megalithic yard and the reverence for the goddess were passed on through time by secret societies such as the Freemasons. It's just one more example of our connection to the past in ways 